Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Dick, and on behalf of myself and my Commerce Next co-founders, Veronica Sonset and Scott Silverman, I'd like to welcome you to our third webinar on the impact that COVID-19 is having on digital retail. Today is Wednesday, April 8, 2020, and today's topic is e-commerce consumer behavior in the time of a pandemic. Joining me today on the call are our presenters, Sucharita Kodali, VP and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research, and Jean-Marc Balachet. Chief Strategy Officer at Content Square. In addition, joining us are John Mandel, SVP Membership Marketing and Global E-Commerce at Weight Watchers, and David Cost, VP of Digital and E-Commerce at Rainbow Apparel Company. We have a lot to cover, so let's take a look at the agenda. We'll start with some housekeeping notes to let you know where things are on your screen. Next, Sucharita will dive into the data by looking at new information from Forrester Research and then reviewing the latest results from Commerce Next second impact of COVID-19 retail and e-commerce survey. John Mark will take over after that to share the latest content square information on consumer behavior. We'll then get you, the audience involved with some interactive polling and we'll take the last 20 minutes to talk with our panel and take your questions. So let's take a look at some housekeeping. First of all, don't worry about missing anything. We're recording this webinar and we should have it for you by tomorrow morning. Now let's take a moment to take a look at where things are on your screen. The tiny arrow is pointing to the upper right-hand corner of your screen where you can find the Q&A, polls, and handout information. If you have a question, just put it in at the bottom there on the Q&A section. We'll curate it, take a look at it, and if we think it's worth taking a look at, we're gonna put it in the publish section. When that happens, you can upvote it. That will let us know which questions you think are the most important for us to review. Handouts are available as well. We're going to have the deck here for you to take a look at. And if you're listening to this on a recording, all you need to do is take a look at the document icon at the bottom of the screen of the recording uh, device, and you can get the downloads of both the handout as well as the poll results. Before we start, there's a whole bunch of thank yous to give. First of all, we want to thank the nearly 100 digital retail executives who completed our second survey. We appreciate their uh, cooperation very much. And just as a reminder, our next survey will be April 13th and 14th. And if you find this information valuable, we would certainly appreciate you taking the five minutes to take the survey. Also, a big thank you to Forrester's Sucharita Kudali, who has analyzed this data and produced the findings in these slides. And so without any further ado, let me turn this over to Sucharita Kudali, the VP and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. Thank you, Alan. And I want to be sensitive to um, the fact that some of these slides may be um, a little bit slow um, to loading. But what I want to start with is some macro level data on what we were seeing in March and what we will see in April. Um, so the census divides different sectors into the categories that you see here. And we looked at how both traffic and sales were trending amongst the various companies that we either connect with or have survey data from or publicly allow announced information. Information. And as you can see, with few exceptions, um, we have a number of different categories that are trending in the negative double digits um, and very few trending in the positive categories at the top. And even amongst those that are trending positively, we're seeing mid double digit gains. So those March figures that you see on the far right hand side is the amount of revenue that those different categories are actually generating. And then when I break that down into what that translates from a number standpoint, that really highlights some very, very stark differences and a significant part of what we are seeing in what we saw in the month of March being a negative 100 um, plus billion dollars in decline, um, a significant part of that coming from car dealers and restaurants alone, um, offset a little bit by sectors like grocery and warehouse club um, on the on the upside. But uh, but the fact that you saw some of those boot ticket categories really declining was a significant part of um, of the negative figures, and that gets reinforced and is also going to happen in the month of April. In April, we expect to even be worse, the reason being um, that there weren't the first few weeks as there were in March that um, that did have relatively normal sales. We expect a full shutdown through all of the month of March, and the impact that that will have on e-commerce is that whereas e-com um, historically has been trending at about 16 to 17% 17, 17 online uh, of, of all of retail sales, 
we expect in April 2020 e-commerce to be about 25% of overall retail sales. Um, and the growth figures um, to be more pronounced, of course, in some of those sectors that seem to be pretty um, uh, positively impacted um, by the category, by, by what's happening with COVID-19, like grocery and warehouse clubs, um, and a similar story on the downside um, with the negative fall off. And, uh, and as I'd mentioned, um, a lot of the fall off was just the last two weeks in March, and we have all of April um, to, uh, to look at here. Um, the other piece that I think is important to uh, to recognize, and uh, this was um, somewhat reinforced from the data that um, we shared in a webinar a couple of weeks ago, which is um, how this compares relative to even the recession of 2008, 2009. And um, while March um, put us in the territory of the the, the last recession, um, April puts us into uncharted territory. And what you see in the April numbers here whether you're talking about a category like car dealers or clothing stores, um, these are significant fall-offs um, that eclipse even the 2008 drop-off. This is April and March numbers for each of the last 12 years. Um, so, so this is something that as an industry, of course, that we have to contend with. And um, what I want to jump into now are the results um, that you all had answered for the Commerce Next survey. So thank you again, just echoing um, Alan's point of, uh, of just appreciation for, for everyone who did participate and help us create um, a, a portrait of what's happening in the industry. Um, this is just a layout of who all participated in the survey. We have a combination of different sizes, different sectors, um, and different business types, um, both manufacturers, well, manufacturers, omni-channel, peer plays, et cetera. Um, we know that companies have um, substantially uh, changed to the negative their employee headcount. Um, when we asked retailers, did you reduce your workforce or has salaries been reduced? Certainly the workforce numbers um, have, uh, have been reduced substantially, even more so for the apparel companies than for the sample at large. Um, and even for some of those companies that reported being above plan, and we'll dig into who those above plan retailers are shortly, even they reported having um, a bit of some reduction in, in their workforces. Um, and those reductions, just some, some open-ended quotes on the left-hand side, um, involved a lot of furloughs, holding out merit pay, um, and uh, at the expense of some of the salaried workers, um, increasing hourly workers instead. And of course, the furloughs. Um, also uh, a way to um, help uh, maintain the, the to, to help reinvigorate if uh, you know when when the uh, the social distancing gets released um, to maintain those workers but also empower them to go collect unemployment insurance um, if, uh, if if they were in a position to do so um, we know that sales overall um, are continuing to get worse. Um, Veronica actually on the last conference next webinar presented some of this data and you can see on the right hand slide the dark bars really almost show a tale of two retailers. You have some retailers, and these are the retailers that I called the above plan retailers, um, and that was almost as large as the percent of retailers that are significantly below plan. And we compared that with um, how companies were trending from the surveys that we did um, back in mid-March, asking them about their February and March numbers, um, we certainly see that apparel and accessories in particular has had a really, really rough patch, um, that nearly half of them are significantly below plan, and you'll see um, a number of their behaviors also changing to address that. Um, so you may be having questions. I certainly had questions in looking at this data. Who are these people who are above plan? Um, and this is just a, a little bit of a, a sampling of how the above plan retailers co um, compare to the total sample. They tend to be smaller. They tend to be some of our or the smallest respondents um, in the sample set. They tend to be um, digital first, uh, at the digitally native, vertically integrated brands. Um, and they also tend to be in categories uh, that are consumable related, health, beauty, personal care, um, grocery, food, and beverage. So, so that um, hopefully gives you a little bit of a sense of, of, of where these companies are more likely um, to, to be. Now, we also know um, that in addition to revenue and plan, um, there are other metrics that are also important to look at, like traffic. 
Um, so just again, comparing data from mid-March to later in March, we conducted this last survey, March 30th and 31st. Um, we certainly saw that there were some variances. Some retailers saw higher traffic, others saw lower traffic. Um, that was relatively consistent with the overall sample set. But again, the apparel and accessories retailers saw the biggest drop off. Um, not surprisingly, uh, this was a, a trend that had been going through much of the month of March, also reflected in um, you know, some of the challenges with uh, their physical store closures as well. Um, we're also seeing more um, of a shift from stores to the web, but not everybody. So in March, when we did the survey, we saw 35% of companies saying that they were able to migrate shoppers to the web, um, and that number grew to 57% in the, the survey at the end of March. Unfortunately, um, the challenge is that we still have 43% of the respondents that, uh, that haven't seen um, that shift yet. So it's, uh, it's still a work in progress. Um, and as a result, we're seeing forecasts being adjusted. Um, we have uh, a significant portion in this case um, over 40% significantly decreasing their forecasts, um, but for and and you do have a very small percent actually increasing um, their their forecasts. But uh, but this is this is not surprising given given how the the numbers have been trending. Um, we also know that um, behaviors and the offerings and the services that retailers have been offering have changed slightly. Perhaps the most clear one is that returns um, have grown significantly in flexibility with respect to the length of return times or um, what uh, what you're generally how long you've given um, shoppers to be able to bring things back. Um, other areas like fulfillment capabilities and phone support have been more challenged and there is much of a chance of kind of pulling back from from those um, services as, as adding to those services. This was an area that we know a lot of retailers have questions about, which is regarding marketing spend. And um, we have seen um, a significant portion of respondents, almost 70%, decreasing their marketing spend, um, and apparel and accessories retailers being more likely to decrease their spend. And when you look at the light blue, to the degree that anyone's increasing their spend and trying to seize the day, it is coming from those above plan retailers that, of course, have the luxury to be able to spend now. Um, where are those shifts going? I just want to draw your eye to the green versus the red. So everything in green are the uh, tactics where retailers are increasing their spend. Everything in red and pink are where they are decreasing their spend. So across the board, everything, at least as far as retailer marketing, is decreasing. However, to the degree that people are spending more, um, they tend to be spending more in search, paid search and paid social. Um, and if, uh, if you think that the story may be grim with respect to digital marketing, um, it's even more grim with respect to traditional offline marketing where there's almost no increases um, and substantial decreases, um, at least amongst um, digital retailers that responded to this survey. Um, now, those above plan retailers, those are the ones I, I do think it'll be interesting to keep an eye on because they may be the ones that buoy the entire retail recovery. Um, they too are spending more um, in most of those tactics, and they were the ones that were driving most of the, the green um, elements of the previous slides. They're increasing their spend in search, social, affiliates and uh, and the other tr other the other channels that you see there um, and we also know that from a messaging standpoint um, these uh, there's a little bit of slight adjustment um, we tend to see more of the incorporation of sympathy and compassion um, and that's followed by um, by certainly in the case of apparel retailers promotional messaging um, but also you have a significant portion of, uh, of retailers recognizing that um, the products that they may be able to provide um, are really about offering an escape or some kind of entertainment um, that consumers may be, may be interested in. Um, and uh, the, one of the last slides that I want to share here is that manufacturing um, and how retailer contribution um, to the COVID-19 crisis is, uh, is often in, in providing masks or face shields or hand sanitizers 
It's even higher. Um, it's actually highest with the apparel and accessories companies, companies like Brooks Brothers and Carhartt and others that leaned into this because of their manufacturing capabilities. Um, and then it's less likely to happen with those above plan retailers um, who, of course, are likely just focused on, uh, you know, kind of getting orders shipped out the door. Um, and with that, I'll hand um, the mic back over to, to Alex. Thank you very much, Sucharita. Very nice. So before I hand this over to Jean-Marc, let me just remind everyone that you can use the Q&A feature to start asking your questions. And with that, let me reintroduce Jean-Marc Balachet, the Chief Strategy Officer from Content Square. Jean-Marc, it's all yours. Thank you, Alan. Uh, one quick word about Content Square. So we are a, a SaaS company. We help our clients to improve their digital experience. Uh, and basically, we capture everything that is happening on their website, any movement of the mouse, any movement of the finger on mobile is captured by the technology. And I'm happy to share uh, some uh, proprietary data that we have uh, fully aggregated across uh, more than 800 websites worldwide. Um, and basically, we've been tracking uh, week after week uh, what's happening for those 800 websites. This represents a huge sample of data. We are talking about close to 6 billion visits of websites. This is purely online, of course. Uh, this corresponds to 28 billion page views, uh, just to give you the order of magnitude, uh, across 26, 26 countries and for 22 industries. So what is it that we are seeing? First, uh, focusing on traffic, uh, and you see that slide four times, so I'll explain a little bit the, the, the methodology here. We looked at the first six weeks of the year and we called them pre uh, coronavirus period. This is the time where, yes, it was true in, in China already, there were deaths in China, but in the Western countries, in the US, in Europe, clearly no, nobody was talking much about it. Uh, um, and it, it's only late February, mid February that started to be to be an issue here in, in, in Europe or in the US. First death in Europe happened in, on February 14, and then from there it's only picked up. Uh, quarantine, the first quarantine uh, happened in Italy in March 9th, and then France followed, uh, and then U.S. with New York and California uh, in confinement, not that strict, but still in confinement uh, from March 22. So what you can see on the chart is if you take uh, the in reference period and the base of 100, 100 uh, late February, uh, we were below 100, so people were probably more focused on something else than just going online. And from then, it has only accelerated, and in particular, the last three weeks, when confinement started had been uh, highly uh, accelerated. Uh, and we are today, as we speak, 10% above normal uh, levels. Uh, transaction picture is even uh, more uh, interesting and, 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 uh, and show a bigger impact of this confinement. As you can see, you know, before, before the confinement, you know, traffic was up and down around 100, 100 so 100, uh, around our index. But today and last week, and this is the data that I'm presenting is actually from last Sunday, so it's very, very hot data. You can see that the week ending last Sunday was actually 32% uh, up versus our reference period. And just in one week, you can see if you compare the two, two data points, we, we were able to gain 20 points of traffic of transaction just last week. So to show that there is an acceleration uh, of uh, purchase online. Uh, we also look at engagement, and here I'm, I'm showing just two metrics, page views and time per session, and this is the same story. Uh, before the quarantine started, even when people were, were, were you know, worried about the, the, the coronavirus, uh, you know, the engagement was not super strong, and then it has only picked up since then. The last three weeks have seen a large acceleration of those metrics, which shows that people have more time, they, they work from home, they are, their desktop is with them every day, and, and they can do more surfing and spend more time on, on websites overall. So this is the big picture, but uh, you know what's interesting is of course to deep dive by industry. So similarly to what uh, was was presented by Charita a few minutes ago, I'm going to show you data by industry. This is the traffic view by industry. Again, uh, you know zero percent mean, means no change versus the reference period, and we look at the last week ending Sunday, April 5th, versus the reference period. And what we see is that the supermarkets uh, tripled uh, times 2.8, 189% increase. So huge traffic on supermarkets, no surprise. Many stores are either closed or, or completely crowded. Or we have to queue, so people are rushing online to see if they can buy goods. Uh, media is up. Of course, people are getting more information. 
Uh, retail tech is up. Uh, a lot of equipment, and when we see the transaction, a lot of people are buying games, a lot of people are buying uh, PCs, uh, laptop, Chromebook. Uh, telecom is up, also checking on, on you know, their, their bandwidth and their, and their subscription. Uh, bank is also rather up, plus 20%. Um, a lot of trading, a lot of credit, uh, a lot of savings uh, accounts are open. Uh, cosmetic is slightly up uh, as well, um, not huge. And then at the bottom, you see a couple of sectors that are really struggling. Of course, no surprise, entertainment, even ticketing and tourism are at the bottom. Uh, nothing is happening there. And so minus 70% versus regular traffic. And then luxury and jewelry are also severely hit. Uh, fashion is flat in, in terms of traffic in our, in our sample. So this is traffic, but more interestingly is to look at transactions. And here we are showing, uh, again, same, same, same data week ending uh, April 5th, last Sunday, compared to the reference pre, pre-COVID-19 uh, period. And I've kept the same order. So basically you have the high, tra- high traffic winner at the top and the, the traffic loser at the bottom. Uh, and you see some correlation, but not perfect correlation. And let, let me highlight that for you. At the bottom, you see a perfect correlation. The players and the industries that are suffering in terms of traffic are suffering at least uh, as much, or, and if not even more, when it comes to transaction. That's the case, of course, of tourism and entertainment. Those two sectors are completely amorphous. We are talking minus 90 or minus 95% uh, of business here. So it's really, really tough. Uh, jewelry and luxury are also severely hit, uh, minus 20%, minus 35%. Uh, at the top, uh, you have supermarket plus 80%. You might recall that in terms of traffic, the growth was much higher, which means conversion rate is uh, struggling in supermarket. And this is due to a lot of product in, in out of stock and a lot of uh, carts that cannot be delivered. I have myself uh, an, an open cart on many online grocery. I live in New York and it's impossible to get a, a, a slot. So that, that's something we, we, we were seeing. You also see that media and telecom, while they were up in, in traffic, they are not uh, that much up in terms of transactions. So people are consulting, uh, getting information, but are not buying new subscription uh, uh, for, for, for that matter. Uh, and then for, for sectors that are probably very interesting for, for this uh, crowd, you see cosmetics is actually up a lot and conversion rate is up uh, uh, in a big way on, on cosmetics. So we are talking about the doubling of the business versus pre, pre-COVID-19 period uh, for, for cosmetics uh, here. And I think this is due to many things that have been done, but in particular, many players have focused on soap uh, and cleaning hand uh, as well as you know, at the end of the day, this is also now close to a couple of weeks that people have been confined. And I know air care is up. Many people are getting white air again, and then they need to, to do their own uh, air care or air coloring. So that's something we've seen. Uh, no surprise on home and furnishing. You know, this, uh, this chair that I've been looking at and needs to be changed, it's time to change it uh, while I'm at home. Same for retail tech. As I said, a lot of gaming uh, products, a lot of Xbox, a lot of Nintendo Switch are sold these days, as well as, as, well as laptop. Um, and fashion, because I know it's also a very interesting uh, um, sector for this audience, fashion in our sample is up 23%. But again, this is very fresh data. And last week made a big change. So this is where uh, you know, I'd like to deep dive a little bit by, by uh, sub, uh, uh, you know, by sector and week and show you how the week change, uh, you know, the weekly change for, for cosmetics and fashion. As you can see on the traffic, there's been a strong acceleration after a decrease. So basically, the first, you know, the first weeks where, where the crisis uh, started, you know, people were not into buying cosmetics, were not into buying fashion, were not into visiting those websites neither. And this has changed a lot recently. And now uh, you can see that the last two weeks have seen a very strong acceleration for cosmetics and also for fashion. Fashion, we've, we've seen our sample winning 20 to 25 points every week for the last two weeks. So from minus uh, 25%, they are now up 25% uh, in two weeks. And cosmetics is up in a big way. And I expect those curves to continue because of course the stores are closed. And so, uh, you know, this is the only way to go is to go to e-commerce. Couple of examples. Uh, I I already mentioned that many players are focusing on hand cleaning. Uh, this is the case for L'Occitane, this is the case for Body Shop, we have many, many other examples. So that's something very smart. You need to focus on products that are relevant for uh, the current crisis. 
And fashion players, I think it's another story, but uh, uh, clearly there's been uh, an acceleration of and an anticipation, I think, of a lot of uh, promotion. Uh, so you can see here, example, for the Gap or Abercrombie & Fitch, uh, which significant discounts uh, that probably were not plan, planned ahead, but this is a way to, to attract uh, traffic to your website and, and to make some good sales. Uh, luxury and jewelry, uh, just to show a uh, slightly different picture, because I know we have some interest in, in this audience. This is much more down, as we discussed already. You can see the only good news is the last week in terms of transaction, you can see a slight recovery. Uh, but frankly, this is just one week. Again, I expect those curves to go up, but we are still below 100, uh, much, much below uh, the, the regular. And, you know, of course, delivery is an issue for many players. We have here the example of Gucci that is not able to deliver, uh, to deliver out of Europe, uh, but is still doing delivery in the US. Now, to conclude, uh, what can be done? We've tried to put here some uh, recommendation or ideas or best practice that you listed. First of all, and I think most of the websites are doing it, but it's very important to acknowledge what's, what's happening and to have a COVID page and explain what's your policy, what do you do, what's changing, uh, are you changing the return policy, are you changing some conditions, uh, what do you do for your employees. This drives quite a lot of traffic. Uh, for, our, for our clients worldwide, we are seeing sometimes up to five. For some sector, actually, we have a few clients where it's 10% of the traffic, so it's, it's big. Um, second point, we think it's time to really focus and improve uh, the online experience. And here, you know, it might be a little bit self-serving for Content Square because this is what we do, but we think that this traffic uh, surge that you've seen on, on many sectors and that will continue because when you see the week by week, and it's interesting to compare the uh, Sucharita's data with mine because ours dates from really, really last Sunday, and you can see a pickup in fashion and a pickup in many sectors. We think it's going to continue because as much as people will stay home for probably another couple of weeks, if not a couple of months, maybe you know a month and a half, two months, who knows, uh, it's clear that people will buy more uh, online and will refer more to, to e-commerce. And as a result, we think some structural behaviors will, will change and, and this traffic level will, will remain very high even after COVID. Going back to a store will not be that easy. That, that's our thesis. So we think it's time to really focus on online and deliver the best online experience. Third topic, do the best with your product. So adapt your offering with what you have. I want to show here this example of a uh, uh, department store calls. Uh, this is uh, their homepage uh, from a few days ago. You know, calls, you might say, might be in difficult position. They sell fragrance, they sell uh, ready to wear. These are two categories that are severely uh, in struggle these days. But, you know, their homepage is telling a different story. It's about, it's fashion, but it's about yoga pants. It's about uh, uh, um, some, some pillar products. Uh, it's about your new corner office and, and some office supplies. It's about wellness and air purifiers. I thought this was interesting to share because uh, uh, a little bit like the cosmetic players are focusing on soap, you can do it. Push promotion to stimulate online demand. I want to show one example here. Uh, we've seen already uh, uh, fashion, but it's also true for jewelry. And jewelry in the U.S., compared to the other segments we have and the other countries where jewelers have not put a lot of promotion, in the U.S., we've seen a lot of promotion, and we've seen conversion rate increase 85% versus uh, pre-coronavirus for this industry, which we think is very, very strong. So advance your promotion when you can. Uh, adapt your supply chain to the new reality. Uh, we've seen many players uh, simplifying order picking. For example, in supermarkets, uh, some players are preparing essential baskets, uh, like you have a veggie basket, a sea product basket, an earth product basket, and it's already done. They can do it uh, uh, overnight, and then you, you, can, you can get delivered very quickly because it's prepared. So we think it's very important. Uh, and the last two points, reinforce customer engagement. Uh, we think it, it's... Uh, you know, even when you, you, you have supply chain issue, you need to tell story to your consumer. You need to keep the engagement. We have examples of some clients that actually not only their stores are closed, but also their e-stores are closed because the warehouse are closed. Uh, that's the case in Europe from, from some clients. And yet they continue to engage. They, you know, they invite people to go to the uh, YouTube channel to see tutorials or to learn something. And we think that's the best practice. And the last point is be a good citizen. Uh, you know, we're all struggling, we're all unsure, and I think you have to be very honest uh, about your customer and tell what you do. That's a little bit the first point. And the last point is very important, behave and do the right things. Like, there is also a temptation for some sectors that are in surge to increase price 
and, and I think it's also a moment of truth and consumer will remember if you don't behave and you, you know, those guys that are selling toilet paper at twice the price or, or Nintendo Switch at twice the price, I think consumer will remember and, and we need to be very careful. Uh, so that's basically the, the data we have. Happy to, to share more. Um, and, and of course, you can, you can also check on contentsquare.com. We have a lot of good data. Brilliant. Really nicely done, guys. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so let's go to the polls. So just to get everyone started here and familiarize you with it, take a look here at the top right of your screen. You can see the poll question or the poll button. Uh, when we're done with the polling, uh, it will show as closed, and you can find the final numbers there. Uh, but when we start polling, you'll see the questions pop up on your screen. So let's get on to this. First question, how does the volume of your e-commerce customer service inquiries compare to pre-COVID levels mid-March? Is it much higher, slightly higher, no change, slightly lower, or much lower? Again, how does the volume of your e-commerce customer service inquiries compared to pre-COVID levels in mid-March. Very interesting numbers starting to come in. Looks like higher is going to be taking it. All right, clearly a, a preference for much higher. Much higher is about uh, 23%, slightly higher is 28%, no change is about 21%, slightly lower 18 and much lower 10%. Perfect, I'm gonna close that poll. And we're going to take our second question here. Which elements of your customer service experience are you planning on improving to address changes in consumer behavior caused by COVID-19. I'll read it again. It's which elements of your customer service experience are you planning on improving to address changes in consumer behavior caused by COVID-19? And we list things like checkout, payment alternatives, product detail pages, navigation, customer service, personalization. Give everyone some time here to go through all those. You can choose as many of them as you wish. Numbers are still coming in. Well, it looks like the winner here is the customer service in and of itself with about 20 to 21% of the uh, voting. We see the product detail pages are coming in at 17%. Uh, followed by checkout improvements at 13%, payment alternatives by 12%. Outstanding. All right, let's close that poll. Got one more for you. Are you worried that essential retailers, for example, Amazon, Walmart, Costco, that are able to stay open will take share away from your business? Again, are you worried that the essential retailers like Amazon, Walmart, and Costco that are able to stay open will take share away from your business? And the answers are yes, no, no, because you're essential, and finally, not sure or haven't thought about it. All right, clearly, clear winner here. Hold on, still more coming in, sorry. Maybe I may want to call that one a little too quickly. Interesting, 49% no, 34% yes, 11% haven't, uh, they're, they're the essential folks themselves, so that's not really relevant, and only 6% aren't sure or haven't thought about it. So very clear opinion on that. All right, I'm gonna close that one. And that uh, concludes the polling here. For the folks listening to this on the recording, you can go to the document icon and we will have the webinar poll result results there as a PDF. Next, let's bring on the rest of our panel. So, John, Dave, you've been sitting in the wings. What are your initial thoughts here? What are you guys thinking? Dave, you want to go first? Sure. Um, 
our experience has pretty much matched what uh, what the two presenters showed. Um, you know, we we initially had um, we we were initially hit pretty hard in the last week or two, at least online. Things have bounced back. Um, you know, if there's any surprises, you know, we operate over a thousand brick and mortar stores that are now essentially all all closed. Um, I think we would have had some expectation that more of that brick and mortar business would have flowed online than what we're seeing. Um, it's it's still a little hard to tell. I mean, uh, online business is up kind of what our trend had been. You know, would it have been worse if, if brick and mortar were open? You know, we don't really know. But um, it's interesting to run the experiment. What happens when you shut off all of brick and mortar to see what happens with online? Yeah, that's quite a gruesome experiment. John, got any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I, from my point of view, I, we follow some of the data. Sometimes it's a little hard for me to kind of parse out the, the two halves of our company, right? Because 85% of WW's revenue comes from our subscription business. But while we're focused on on the commerce part that's split between, you know, we have 3,000 locations that are obviously shut down and our e-commerce business, for us, that business has just shifted over and, and it was pretty, pretty seamless for us. Um, but that's not the case with most. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see how the data is shaking out here. Um, and, and I find it really helpful because we're all sitting at home and we're all kind of in the dark as to what's happening. So these things are, are, are really helpful to not really to realize it, it, things are different than necessarily our exact perspective. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. All right, just a reminder to everyone to ask your questions. And if you see a question there that's in the published section and you want us to pay uh, closer attention to it, uh, give it an upvote and that'll let us know uh, what to take a look at. Um, next up, so let's talk about changing customer service related policy and so policies and support. Um, what, are, what are your opinions on changing things like extending call time hours or more liberal return policies, empowering customer service reps more? We saw some data on that from Sucharita and John Mark. Uh, David, your thinking on this? As, a, as again, as an omni-channel retailer that has both brick and mortar and online, we allow our customers to do our online customers to do returns in store. So we have lengthened um, that 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 uh, that return period. It used to be 30 days. We've lengthened it to 60. Um, and depending upon you know how long stores are closed, we may lengthen it again. Right, but we don't want anyone to hesitate from buying because they think they won't have the opportunity to, to to make a return. So that's the biggest area that we're trying to accommodate uh, kind of the new reality. Mm -hmm. Perfect. John, John Mark, Sucharita, any thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, we're, we're creating more flexibility and empowering the reps to, to just be a little bit more aware that, that everyone's living in a bit of an alternate universe and just be sensitive to it. Most of what we sell is grocery and food items, so the return rate's pretty low on it to begin with. Um, and, and if it's damaged, we usually just send a new one. Um, but there's definitely a sense within the call center that, you know, we're not in normal times and, and we need to, um, you know, really, really focus a lot more on, on treating others the way you want to be treated, um, which doesn't always happen in the business sense, but it's, it's really relevant right now. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the right. only other thing that I would add is um, just that I know that initially in March, companies were talking about trying to figure out how to ha be more flexible with their fulfillment, specifically filling from stores. And um, the ones that um, have leaned into that have already executed against that. But there are a number of sectors like in department stores and apparel that for whatever reason, I think some of it could just be constraints related to their um, landlord clauses in their malls that may be preventing them from doing more of what they would like. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, let's take a look at some of these uh, questions coming in from the audience. Uh, Ryan Matthews uh, has asked, he's curious about uh, furniture e-commerce trends. Do you have any specific data on that subject, uh, Jean-Marc? Yeah, look, I think from the monitoring that we have week after week, uh, I'm expecting uh, e-commerce to go much up uh, in the coming weeks, especially because the confinement is not yet released. Uh, even in, in Italy or Spain uh, and in Europe where it started earlier, 
uh, people are still confined for another month. I think in the US, uh, depending on, on, on the city, but I think it's gonna be also for another month, a month and a half or two months. So basically, I, I'm pretty sure that next week, if I publish the new data, uh, e-commerce and transaction will go, will continue to go up. We, we were able to gain 20 points, which is huge in one week. Uh, you know, I expect another 15 to 20 points, if not more, next week. So I think it's going to continue for a few more weeks. And I also think that most of it will remain even after the crisis. I think, uh, again, we see many play, many consumers that were not used to go direct to consumers. They were used to buy these products through a retailer or through wholesale or through uh, a multi-brand retailer, and now they go directly to the brand and they see they can be shipped and it, it works. So I see more and more uh, this coming. So I, I think e-commerce will continue to go up for uh, the near future. Outstanding. So, Jarita, any thoughts on the uh, furniture e-commerce trends? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there are um, companies like Wayfair actually um, did announce that they were trending um, a bit higher than what they had even projected and where they had been trending. So that's one data point of a company that should have strong Q1 results um, that's in the furniture space, although they are a pure play. And um, they also said that they thought that um, Amazon focusing on essentials and not focusing on their category was um, a catalyst on their behalf. Um, on the other hand, we know that big, big ticket items um, in general, if you're looking for a $10,000 um, dining room set, um, those are probably um, a little bit less likely to, to take off. Um, what we're seeing more of is um, do-it-yourself spring, in, you know, kind of home improvements that are, um, you know, kind of relatively modest investments to, you know, kind of help your, your home. And, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Alan. Just I read future future e-commerce trend. I didn't read read furniture furniture. So I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just being <laughs> uh, just, just checking my data in our sample. <laughs> when you take when you take furniture, so home and do it yourself. So it's a mix of both. Uh, we have a doubling of transactions compared to pre-coronavirus. Uh, 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 trend and and last week was also was quite strong. I think it was a, a win of 20 points. So what I said about the 20 points on average is also true for furniture. But we're already at times two uh, in transaction compared to before, uh, and I think this is going to continue to go up. All right, perfect. All right, Ryan, thank you very much for that question. Doug Jensen, let's go to your question. What guidance should online retailers take on assuring package delivery is safe? For example, that the packages are sterile or hygienic. That's uh, that's open to anyone here. Dave, let me, let me lean on you if you to in case everyone's just waiting to <laughs> answer that question. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, again, I'm not a medical professional, but from what I understand, the, the virus doesn't live long on on packages. So um, the CDC guidance is that there is no problem. Um, you know, receiving packages in the mail or even when you take your groceries home, right? That, you know, after you touch something that's been outside, you wash your hands, but um, um, otherwise that's it. I mean, we've taken precautions in our fulfillment center, um, you know, to test uh, those workers when they come in to see if they've got a fever or not um, and to make sure that they're practicing social distancing within the building. Um, but I guess that's that. That's all I can really add there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think John. From our point of view, it's, it's we're really more focused on making sure that the the people are are safe rather than the packages themselves. There there seems to be less of a concern uh, on that. Uh, you know, as from what we're hearing from from the medical professionals, but we are making sure that uh, we're making sure that the people who are coming to work can come to work safely and feel safe about doing it. I think that's more where the energy has been going. Mm -hmm. All right. And finally, we've got a question from Pedro Cobb, uh, definitely has to do with uh, inventory. Uh, he's asking multiple questions here. Uh, they're all related. Once stores open, will there be a glut of inventory, both from closed stores and backed up containers? And how long do you think it'll take to get through that uh, excess inventory? And do you think that there's going to be a reemergence of things like flash sale sites? Uh, Sucharita, Jean-Marc, let me open with you guys. Oh, I was going to say, I'd love to hear the retailer thoughts on on that. Um, I mean, I, I think that there are a lot of, um, 
you know, kind of, a lot of factors going in lots of different directions here. So yes, there is all this inventory that is um, backing up in stores, especially apparel retailers that can't turn their inventory if it's trapped there. But on the other hand, they don't have money to be putting in orders for Q4 either. And um, they're, you know, kind of cutting back on what is even, um, you know, kind of on route or on route now. So it raises big questions around well, what happens with Q4 and are we just going to try to extend what we can that we have in stores now to be relevant still in Q4? So I don't, I don't know, you know, I mean, I, I know that some multi-category retailers have been trying to really look hard at their inventory and, you know, what can, what is timeless and what can, you know, kind of we keep that, um, that we know is still going to be selling in November, December you know, and try to cut as much of the seasonal merchandise as possible. All right. John Mark? John? Dave. Yeah, no, ju maybe just a compliment. I think the, the question, Pedro's question on, on the flash sale, uh, I think it's a very smart point that he's, he's, he's making. Uh, so I, I would agree that, yes, uh, uh, in, in some categories and probably fashion, uh, and I would love to, to know what Dave think about it, but I could see uh, more inventory flowing to flash sales uh, websites uh, uh, in the coming weeks and months. All right, outstanding. John or Dave, any final thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think I mean, for us, we're not. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, sorry. I, I think it depends on how long this lasts, right? I mean, we we sell we sell trendy fashion, so um, you know, there's seasonality to the product. So it depends on how long the stores are closed, how long that merchandise is trapped there, and at you know at what point in the uh, at what point in the calendar do those stores open back up? Cool, John. My final word. Yeah, I was going to say the, the, the only thing we're really we're not worried about stuff backing up in the warehouse because we're moving through that pretty quickly. But there is some you know best buy date stuff sitting in in all of our studios. So um, depending how long this lasts. You know that's going to have to either be uh, tossed or, or donated, which is is a shame. But uh, we have a lot of food that's just trapped at the moment. All right. I want to ask how conversion rates are being uh, impacted by the pandemic. Uh, Jean Marc's data show that user page views and uh, time per session metrics were up from their mid March lows. Is this translating into better conversion rates for you guys? Yeah, our, our conversion rates are significantly higher than they've been. Um, and that's been pretty consistent throughout all the traffic channels um, where, where that traffic's coming from. So uh, the folks that are coming, uh, they want to buy, uh, and that's great. So there's a lot less of, of, of browsing and a lot more of, of searching and buying now, uh, which is, has been helpful in getting us a higher return on the marketing spend that goes against it. Okay. Dave? No, I'm sorry. So let's uh, let's move to a slightly different question here. I want to talk about discounting for just a moment. Uh, Jean Marc uh, noted earlier that some retailers are using discounting to stimulate sales. Now this is um, what our webinar attendees told us two weeks ago when we asked them the following questions. We asked them, "What are some of the ways you plan to relaunch and stimulate traffic?" And two weeks ago, the third uh, most popular answer was deep discounting, and then we asked them, uh, after the crisis is over, what will the promotional environment look like, and just overwhelmingly much more promotional. And I'd like to hear your thoughts about discounting in a pandemic. Uh, do you think customers will demand that discounts continue in the post-pandemic world? Could this be brand damaging? And if so, what can be done to help mitigate the damage? Um, so I'll let you ponder those slides. John? It, I mean, to, to me, it's 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 what you're asking, which is pr promotions during a pandemic, but it's also promotions during a recession, right? Because as terrible as that sounds, we're we're seeing what's happening with unemployment and those numbers, and if we're going to capture uh, the money that that's out there from from members, I, I think we're going to have to be promotional, and and give people a reason to come back. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Dave? 
we are discounting. So, um, you know. <laughs> very simple. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I mean, we're we're an everyday low price retailer, so we don't normally discount um, other than product that isn't moving. Um, but you know, our experience during this event has been you've got to go above and beyond what you normally do, um, so people people feel some some reason or some urgency to pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jean Marc or Citrita, any thoughts on this before we move on? Yeah, this seems like it's going to be um, a more exaggerated version of um, of the last recession. So, um, and we certainly saw a significant amount of discounting then. Um, and it, uh, I think it just it, it it's what one has to has to contend with. And then, to the degree that you can, you gradually, um, you know, have to change your um, product mix or your brand mix um, in an attempt to with whatever are the new hot brands to try to, to get to, you know, kind of higher margins over time. Mm-hmm. All right. John Mark, final thought. Well, look, uh, you know, we also expect maybe uh, some change and, and, you know, especially in the U S it's true that uh, American consumers have, have been uh, doped with discount and cheap product, and and there is also a scenario where uh, out of this crisis, people will will try to say, okay, I need to pay the right price. You know, th- there is no way this T-shirt is sold five dollars or whatever whatever the price. You know, it's too it's too it's too low, and I, I can expect maybe a, a little bit of change. I'm not I'm not. Uh, uh, you know, a chief of society analysis or whatever would be the title. But I think it might be a little bit of more consciousness that when you pay too low of a price, there is something wrong with it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, while we're on the subject, uh, Emily Hatcher, one of our attendees, was asking, do you have any predictions about po- post-quarantine trends? And I remember, Dave, you were talking on the prep call about stores and how they're going to look differently. And I'd like I think I'd like you to share that with the group. So I thought there was some nice stuff in there. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're starting to worry about, so, you know, what happens to the store experience when when people are allowed to go out again? Because I don't think it's going to go exactly back to the way it was before. So, um, you know, think about things like the payment terminals and stores. What are we going to have to do to, to disinfect or clean those, be, you know, between, you know, every customer? Um, will customers be willing to pick up a stylus and, and sign a keypad? Um, you know, what happens with cash? Um, you know, will we have to have, you know, rubber gloves for store associates to be able to handle cash in stores? Um, you know, will we have, you know, we're thinking about putting signage up, talking about contactless payment. Um, so I think, you know, there's lots of aspects of that store experience that are going to be different as we come out of this. Um, you know, not that we have all the answers, but we're really starting to think about those and, and think about what it's going to take to pre-position um, goods and materials to support that uh, once we get the sign to start to open again. All right. Anyone else want to comment on that? What this, What are the trends going to be after we get out of the post-containment world? All right. Yeah, as I said, as I said earlier, maybe I I, I think uh, uh, I, I expect traffic on websites to to make a step change before and after coronavirus, and I expect you know more transaction, more more conversion, and overall the weight of of e-commerce. So, for example, the slide that Chicharita presented earlier with the 25% e-commerce, I think we're going to remain at higher level, higher weight of e-commerce as total sales. Uh, in, in, in you know in, even in the, in the after crisis uh, period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I I think a lot of things. I think what this is going to do is being locked up for three months is is yeah. going to speed us up in right. It's going to speed us up years in terms of uh, how we are and have continuing to embrace technology. Whether that's how we all work from home, how we educate people, and certainly how we shop. So I don't know exactly how it's going to be felt, but as our business had continued to grow online, it is exponentially growing online right now. And I don't think that it shifts back at the same rate it shifted forward um, when the stores are back open again. And and I think we have to figure out what what really that means and, and what roles those are going to play. 
I and I think what I will add to that is that the results of that could be catastrophic um, because we are already overstored as it is. And if there is no ability for physical stores to um, be able to pull their own weight, that has tremendous repercussions for the real estate industry, for the banks that are financing real estate um, and communities that are dependent on that real estate. Um, hopefully, what we will see is um, a lot of um, the uh, the manifestations of omni-channel and things like curbside pickup and inventory visibility, because that is something that we have seen a lot of, is a lot of the cross-channel that um, we'd, we'd always been talking about, it, but had never seen to the degree that we see it now. Um, and hopefully, that will buoy the stores, the physical stores. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's great for those of us in e-commerce, but, you know, you have the whole ecosystem of a community and cities and, um, and, and residents of those communities that, that also have to contend with, with the, the fallout from that shift. Okay. So, uh, so Tracy Herman has asked, is there potential for growth to go on third-party marketplaces, especially for discretionary categories, to offset slowdowns in wholesale. Uh, for example, moving to Amazon as a result of reduced bookings or cancellations. Do we think Amazon will come out stronger post-COVID-19, especially for prime shoppers in discretionary and luxury categories? Very interesting so, question. One of the things I would say there is, is certainly my feelings on how Amazon's playing in this uh, have really changed actually based on how, in what areas they've been able to handle this well and what areas they haven't, right? I think we all realize we don't need things in two days anymore now that Amazon decided not to send anything in two days anymore. Um, so I think that's interesting. But also, we've actually seen a, a decrease in our Amazon business while at the same time seeing exponential growth in our, in our own e-commerce channel. Um, because right now I can fulfill faster myself than I could through Amazon and, 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 and we were fulfilled by Amazon. So I think for where Amazon's doing a really great job, that helps. Where they're not, they're not. And there are a lot of things that are sold out on Amazon that Amazon's having a harder time restocking their inventory on than a lot of retailers can do them on their own. And, and I think that's going to change things for sure. All right. All right, the last question, I'm going to give this to Suchari to start off with. Um, the, the, one of the poll questions was, are you worried that essential retailers like Amazon, Walmart, and Costco uh, that are able to stay open will take share away from your business? 50% of the folks that answered that said no, while only 33% answered yes. Any reaction to that? Is that kind of what you expected, not what you expected? Just curious. Um. I, I, I was a little surprised because, and, you know, obviously it depends on who, who's actually responding and, you know, kind of what sectors that they're in. Um, but I think that what, one of the things that is important to keep in mind is that, that this um, crisis is one that will, um, you know, and the actions that have been taken, particularly re with respect to what's allowed to stay open or what's not, um, well, just uh, to me, seems like it's going to separate, um, you know, the strong from the weak even more. And, you know, kind of in the best of circumstances, retail was doggy dog. And on top of that, you just handicapped um, a significant portion of the industry um, by, by just not even allowing them to, to play in the game. And um, and if I were a retail CEO, I would be livid and I would, um, you know, kind of and, and understanding that, you know, there's only so much that, that you can do and you can't blame your customers or communities, but you can stand in line and try to get a government handout to support you um, and to maintain your business continuity so that when things do gradually come back, it'll be a smoother transition. All right. And I think with that, we are going to start wrapping up here. Just want to remind everybody that you can come to commercenext.com to check out our COVID-19 Digital Retail Resource Center. All of our webinars uh, will be available there, both the past and the uh, ones coming up in the future. We have our research and blogs there, 
as well as a community data resource area where we take um, the most useful information we can find on the web and put it out there for you to use for benchmarking data. That's commercenext.com forward slash COVID forward slash. We also have a few ways that you can help. Now, the Restaurant Workers Community Foundation Relief Fund um, is a good program. We have open source COVID-19 medical supplies in the Restaurant uh, Workers Relief Program. All are good initiatives, something you should all check out. And with that, we're going to call it a day. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. If you have any questions, you can email us at founders at commercenext.com. My name is Alan Dick. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you so much to Content Square for sponsoring. And everyone have a good week. Stay safe. We'll see you here next week for the latest in digital retail information. Take care now.